Ooh. Hello. Hey, Chris Anderson. Rick Byer. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's a beautiful sunny day in London. Excellent. And it's a beautiful sunny day in Chicago. And uh, we're here for another edition of History Happy Hour. Did you did you bring a little cocktail of choice? Yeah, I, I've noticed that with each passing week, my pour gets a little higher. It's a little bigger. Yeah. yeah. What are you, now, what is the? You're a single malt, so what is it? Uh, Glen Levitt, twelve. Yeah. So I have a I have kind of a no name uh, scotch here, but it does have a name on the shot glass, uh -huh. and I do mean shot glass. <laughs> okay. That's Aaron Burr, and um, you so know, I, you know something about. No, I've forgotten most of what I know about uh, Aaron Burr, but there's a little bit. He They made a musical about him. Oh, really? You know, if you've ever seen that musical, he is the star of the musical. I mean, <laughs> Hamilton is like the number two guy in the musical. So anybody, welcome to everybody who's who's joining us. Please sign in and say uh, hello. And Paul Woodage is drinking a singleton that we're happy to hear about that. And Eric Flint is here. And Michael, Chip Young, a bunch of folks here. Please let us know that you're around. Today we have a very special guest. Yeah, we're going uh, to join Christopher and I. Uh, and my phone is now ringing. It's very exciting. <laughs> well, uh, turn off the phone. Yeah. So um, go away, phone. Hey, Doreen. And um, we have a very special guest joining us today, Seymour Nussenbaum, who was a veteran of the Ghost Army during World War II. Uh, and before we bring him in, I want to explain to those of you who, unlike Chris, have not uh, heard me talk ad infinitum about this subject, what the ghost army was. And let me describe it this way. Uh, you're in, imagine that you're like Seymour, Nussenbaum, you're in the army, the year is 1944, and you get your orders, and your orders are to head to Europe, to head to France, you're going to go to the front lines, and you're going to put on a show. You're going to put on a show for the enemy. You have to stage a complex multimedia production spread out over many miles and do so for an attentive and discerning audience that wants nothing more than to kill you. <laughs> Sounds fun so far, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and next week you'll have to do it again. And that, in a nutshell, was the mission of the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, uh, also known as the Ghost Army. Uh, and so what this really involved is impersonation. So they're impersonating other American units. Uh, let, let me give you an example. Let's say that, um, Chris, you can you be the 6th Armored Division? I'm the 6th Armored, yep. You are the 6th Armored oh, Division. Yeah. Can we see, can we see your, your, uh, your armor there? Okay, so there's Chris, and he's the 6th Armored Division, and he's over there. But we don't want the Germans to know that he's over there or over there, whichever way you are. And so we're going to be over here pretending to be the 6th Armored Division. Ooh. We're pretending to be. So we hope that the enemy is firing on us. Meanwhile, Chris is getting ready to attack. And what happens when you attack, Chris? <laughs> yes, well, you hope the enemy has all come over here. And right. so you can attack with much more success over there. And that, in a nutshell, with two Sherman tanks. And didn't you just know that Chris and I would both have a Sherman tank on our desk? Um, is what the Ghost Army did in their operations. And to carry out these impersonations, sorry, Chris. No, I'm, I'm, still, just... I'm still talking here. To carry out these impersonations, they used uh, inflatable tanks like this one, they used uh, sound effects. Uh, played from giant speakers on the top of half tracks. And they also used uh, impersonation where they would put um, uh, 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 bumper markings of the unit they're impersonating or sh wear shoulder patches of the unit they're impersonating uh, in order to fool any enemy spies who were left behind. And they did this in basically 22 different deception missions in Europe starting a few weeks after D-Day. This is totally different than Operation Fortitude and going to the end of the war. So that is the story of the Ghost Army. And uh, the gentleman that we're going to talk to about it today, Seymour Nussenbaum, served in the 603rd Camouflage Engineers, 
which was the visual deception arm of the ghost army. Here's Seymour. I think there's a picture of Seymour. Uh, and uh, so these are the guys who worked with the inflatable tanks, but he also was very involved with those phony shoulder patches I talked to you about. And I'm sure we'll get to that when we discuss it with him. And uh, let's bring him in, if I can pull it off here. Seymour Nuckenbaum, how are you doing? I'm, far. I'm doing fine. Excellent. Well, we are so delighted that you're joining us here today. And where are you joining us from? Monroe Township, New Jersey. Joining us from New Jersey. So we hope you're staying very safe and uh, appropriately socially distanced there in New Jersey. Yes, so not, yeah. there's a nod. Seymour can be a man of few words, but we'll see what we can do. <laughs> Uh, Seymour, you, um, you're 96 now, correct? Right, until next month. Until next month, uh, when we hope you'll become 97. And um, you are, that means you must have been 17 or 18 at the time of Pearl Harbor, right? Uh, so I'm wondering, how did you, what was your journey, you know, that got you into the U.S. Army and got you into the 603rd Camouflage Engineers? Well, when I first heard about Pearl Harbor, uh, I knew immediately that I was going to get into the Army. There's no way out of it. So um, I was, at the time, going to Pratt Institute to study art, and they offered a course in camouflage which I took, and uh, I figured, well, maybe when I finish the course and I finish the year, I would volunteer, but uh, the Army was too quick. They got me before, so I went into the service, and while I was at Pratt, the, uh, the instructor, uh, the camouflage instructor, told us that if when we get to the army, we should tell them about this unit, which I did, and which they completely ignored. Of course, it's the army. So I was sent down to uh, Virginia Beach to be in, in an artillery outfit. And uh, I don't like to take no for an answer, so I wrote a letter to the um, 23rd. Uh, it wasn't the 23rd, and the 603rd at the address that this person who spoke at Pratt gave me. And I told him where I was, and I said I would love to join their outfit because I took these courses. And uh, two weeks later, I was transferred. Because uh, at the time, that was a very hot item, and uh, they had priority of getting people that they wanted from wherever. I think one of the things that that you just said there that was, um, I think might strike people as unusual is that they were teaching a camouflage course at Pratt Institute, which was the uh, a university college that uh, in, in Brooklyn that you were attending. Uh -huh. And they were doing this at a lot of different art schools because of the war. Uh -huh. Well, you know, Rick, I have a question. For both of you, it seems like this got going pretty quickly. So, when was the army actually starting to think about this? You know, how soon did I, I don't know the the uh, dates. I I, uh, I know that when I got to uh, Fort Meade in Maryland and joined the six o three, we started with basic training, normal basic training. We did some camouflage exercises with, uh, with those crazy colors and everything. And um, we finished our basic. And by that time, they decided to send us to Camp Forest, Tennessee. And that's where we took our training for uh, the missions that we were supposed to go on. Got a little more basic training and uh, we trained with uh, camouflage. We made dummies out of, if I remember rightly, wood and canvas. And I think that, uh, you know, 
building on your answer, Chris, the, there's there's two stages to this, and it can be confusing. The the army knew right away from really before the war that they wanted to have camouflage battalions right, to right. be able to camouflage airplane plants, uh, 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 large headquarters, uh, important buildings, and they, you know, the 603rd was one of several camouflage battalions. But then it wasn't until 1944 that they decided they needed a deception unit in a hurry. And so they kind of Frankensteined it. They took pre-existing units and jammed them together. And so the unit, that Seymour's unit, is the one that they picked to do the visual deception. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting to me because if you look at the Army before the war, they're not exactly known or remembered for a lot of foresight um, in planning for the next war. And this is a case where they actually did. So. Well, from what I know of the story of the ghost army, that they, they had a, uh, a good front man, and he managed to convince them that was uh, Ingersoll, managed to convince them to that this was a good thing to do. Okay. And the army is not easily convinced, so he must have been good. No. no, the army is not easily convinced of, of much of anything. There was another soldier... Um, Seymour, I don't know if you knew Bernie Mason, um, who was in a different company than you in the 603rd. He, oh, yeah. talked, he talked about uh, his first day at basic trading. The, the sergeant said, is there anybody here who's an artist? And so Bernie raised his hand. And they, then for the next week, he painted the garbage cans uh, of the unit. He said it was the last time he ever raised his hand to volunteer yeah. for anything in the Army. That's right. So um, you guys headed over. Uh, you 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 joined up with the other units that were going to be involved in this deception mission, and you headed over to um, England uh, in uh, I think uh, arriving there in May 1944, and you would have been uh, up at Walton Hall, which is up uh, near Stratford on Avon. Right. Uh, you, that's probably where you were when. D-Day took place. Do you have any memories of hearing about that and any feelings about what you thought it might mean for you? We didn't have to hear about it. We knew it because the sky was so full of, of planes going over that you couldn't even see the sky. They were going over by the hundreds, one after another. And we knew something was going on. Did So when when did you arrive... The unit arrived in different pieces. When did you arrive and where did you arrive in Normandy? We well, arrived at Omaha Beach in, uh, I'd say, uh, towards the end of June, third week in June. And, now, I'm sorry, go ahead. And uh, we made the famous climb up that hill uh, that you see in that iconic picture of Omaha Beach and just spent the night in a foxhole. But then we were taken by truck into further uh, east. What was your, I, I, I can't even imagine what that must have been like. Can you describe what that, that day or what that, that feeling was like? Uh, you know, it was like a dream or a nightmare. Uh, you know, we had, first of all, going over from England to France was, is, is what, 20 some odd miles. And um, we had a terrible storm in the English Channel. And they were trying to get the people to shore, the soldiers to shore. One, and we went down the side of the ship, <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, rope ladders. And one guy fell off into the water, and they just grabbed him out before the platform that they were landing on smacked right against the ship because he, he never made it. So they figured it's too dangerous to try and debark at that time. So we spent a few days on board. The rations began to get low because, we, you know, we were only supposed to be on there a few hours, not a few days. But finally, we got off, 
and uh, and what followed? We went up the hill, and that was it. Was there any, was there any? Could you hear any guns, Seymour? Was there any fi shell fire or guns? You could see bodies floating in the water. No. Uh, it was a nightmare. Yeah. And you lost a uh, you lost some one one guy fell into the hold on the LST on the way across, yeah. right? I guess probably because of the, I don't know if it was in the loading or because of the weather, but uh, he was killed. Just, they told us not to go on deck. So we were down below. And the first, the first deck below the top deck. And uh, he was sleeping right next to an open hatch. He must have rolled over and fallen down and broke his neck. Mm. Mm. Not an auspicious start. No. So you guys were you guys went into operation. Your first deceptions are in uh, basically early July. Your first full scale deceptions uh, of 1944. And Seymour, tell us about the company that you served in and what your job was. Well, I I was in the H and S company, and uh, which stands for. Is it headquarters and supply? Headquarters and supply, headquarters and service, something like that. Oh, headquarters and service. Been a long time. <laughs> and, I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, so no worries. Uh, uh, it seems I spent a good part of my uh, time there doing KP. <laughs> and... Uh, to me, were other senseless jobs, but you know, somebody had to do it. But then I was put in the factory section. Uh, factory, factory section. Factory section. Uh, our job in the factory section was to, number one, part, part of the factory section kept the uh, inflatables in repair. Number two was to get uh, to make the shoulder patches. And we also had people who went out and painted numbers on trucks and that sort of thing, painted signs when they were necessary. So this is when you're you're impersonating another division. You're impersonating, let's say, the 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 first division and you're making uh you you, you want to be wearing the first division shoulder patches when you're in town, in case there's any spies left behind. And so you couldn't get enough real ones, so you're basically counterfeiting your own. Right. I don't know who came up with the idea, but it, it was brilliant, because it worked. Uh, first time, when we first started making these patches, we had to improvise. We didn't have uh, too much. So we decided that the material we used to make them on would be old shelter halves, ones that could no longer be used. So shelter halves like tent canvas, essentially. Tent canvas. And it was always khaki. The color was always khaki. And uh, we had to devise a way to do it. And we had one person, I forget who it was, that traced the, the uh, shoulder patch, divided it up into colors, and made a separate printing unit for each color, because we could only print one color at a time. And at first, we cut out the the, uh, the design out of an uh, oak tag. I don't know if you know what oak tag is. It's like a heavy no. cardboard, but it's stiff. It's not bendable, it's not as bendable as cardboard. So we use it as a template. And let's say this is the one that you're showing there with the star. We cut out the hole for the star. And we, we lay it down on the... Uh, and by the way, they were, weren't printed one at a time. They were printed, I think, six at a time. Okay. So we'd have to cut the hole six times. Mm -hmm. And then we put 
uh, with, with the staple brushes, we'd put the white ink in, the white paint, and then we'd have to wait for that to dry. Uh, then we do, uh, after that, we do the black. And you had, so, to get, you had to get them into register so that they, the colors fall where they're supposed to be. So uh, attention to detail is important. It was, yeah, it was a lot of detail. We had register marks on the, the edges of the sheet, which were cut away later. And uh, it was very tedious with, with the uh, stippling. How so, many guys did you have doing this, roughly? I don't remember how many. There were a number of them, because each one had a different uh, job to do, different part of this package to work on. So, so Seymour, did did somebody from, say, Shafe headquarters say, I want you guys to be the first division, or did somebody in your unit say, tomorrow we're all going to be in the first division? Who, where did that kind of come from? Uh, I don't know. I was too low in the, in, in right. the uh, line to be privy to those uh, right. decisions. You know, we were told uh, they brought the patch in. And they say we need a thousand of these, and that's it. In yeah. they were being used for so. How fast would you have to make those thousand patches? As fast as we could. I mean, there's just so much a person can do, you know. Right. You had to cut out the templates. There was one person that did that, and sometimes they were very tricky. Templates were very tricky to cut. A lot of intricate detail. Right. It's it's um you know it it uh, it, it brings up a question I was going to ask later, but I'll I'll ask it now, and we can come back to the patches. But but um, one of the things that that people ask me a lot is how much you guys as individual soldiers understood about your whole mission. I mean, have we, you're doing these deceptions that involve all this different stuff. How much of that were you actually aware of at the time? Well, I can only speak for myself, but uh, I, I didn't know what was going on, to be truthful. I didn't know why they were doing this. But you don't ask questions in the army, you know, you do what you're told. So uh, after a while, we began to put two and two together, especially when we found out what different parts of the unit were doing. So we put two and two together, but they never out and that came and told us, we're doing this mission because we want the Germans to think you know, this and that and the other, never right. said. That's so you, uh, there's one other visual, and I think you have, uh, I think you have it with you, the uh, the 75th Infantry Division uh, page showing the uh, uh, all of the different uh, sort of the the path for making a single patch. Can you show us show us that. I can also put it up on the screen, but I wanted people to see that you you preserved this. You preserved this in your scrapbook. Right. And it, it's uh, the 75th Division. And these are the steps we took. Uh, the first step was to print the, uh, to, to paint the um, canvas white. The whole canvas was painted white. It was, okay. a lot, it was a lot easier than cutting a template and painting the white part. So we painted the whole thing white. Then you see the little triangular marks on the side of the patch? Mm -hmm. Those are register marks. Okay. I'm going to put it up here full screen so that people can see it a little bit more easily. All right. Those were register marks. And the second thing we did was to print the blue. And you can see that they don't register completely because it, that was just the next one registered better then we so, print then we printed the black now, okay. now you notice on the third patch they're like little white bridges 
which help which hold the middle of the template. Okay. It's hard to explain, but they're little bridges. And we couldn't leave them that way, but they oh, were sure. Like little gaps in the outside of it. Right. It held the the uh, inner part. The 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 black thing. Black sure. border. It held that because uh, we couldn't if we cut out a whole border, then the whole inside would fall out. So did you have to hand paint those parts? Hand paint those little things, which is the fourth step. And the fifth step was to cut them out. And so um, how many of these do you think you've made in the course of the war? Well, we spoke about that. We came to the conclusion it was between 30 and 40,000. <laughs> wow. One of the... Uh, um, you know, I, 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 I guess, I, Chris, did you ever think you were going to hear in such detail about the manufacture of counterfeit patches or that that was something that was important in any way in the European theater? That's great. Kidding me? Um, one of the stories I liked was watching the, sh the documentary and then the book talking about the one guy who said that uh, they had to sew all these patches on their uniforms. And they changed patches so many times it was chewing up their shirts, which I thought was kind of a, a wonderful little detail. Uh, yeah. I want to just too bad they invented Velcro yet. Right. <laughs> um, I want to just say to anybody who's joined us um, uh, in progress here, we're talking to Seymour Nussenbaum, who's a veteran of the Ghost Army in World War II and served in the 603rd Camouflage Engineers, the visual deception arm of the Ghost Army. And um, if you have any questions for Seymour, you know, we've, we've been exploring in, uh, in some granular detail the, uh, the counterfeit patches that he worked on. But if you have any questions for him about his role in the Ghost Army or what the Ghost Army did, we would be uh, happy to uh, entertain uh, those questions yeah hey, uh, seymour with the paint and the, the the supplies to make all these things did the army bring them to you or did you guys have to scrounge it yeah no, we we uh we ordered them okay they got them i don't know where they got them but they got them yeah. they mostly enamels okay that we used and uh they took a time to dry that was the big problem Right. You know, you had to dry them between colors. You couldn't just keep doing one color. Uh, I, I have some more patches if you want to look at them. Sure. Let's see what you got. We'll we'll zoom in there. So these are uh, these look are these core patches? I don't know what they are. Yeah, yeah those are core badges. Core, yeah. Yeah, so core patches. Except the bottom one is. Yeah, 4th Armored. An Armored Division. 4th Armored Division, I see that. And that was a rough one because that was four colors. Well, I would, you know, I would imagine if you were a, a German, um, you start getting word that there's a core where you didn't think there was one, that's pretty serious. Okay, so cores are obviously multiple divisions, so that's a lot of troops. Uh, so that's going to cause some German intelligence officer to sit up and take notice um, pretty quickly, I would imagine. Well, we had, yeah. a, we had a lot of tricks for fooling them. For instance, uh, we would want to appear to be more uh, troops than we were. So we'd uh, take our trucks, the ones that uh, we traveled in, that had a, a seat along the side of the truck on each side. And it held maybe 14 people, something like that. And we put two people at the back, well, at the front, really, right near uh, where the uh, part that you step off of, I forget what it was. And uh, the rest of the truck would be empty. And we take that truck and we drive it around all over town. And then we'd, and, and there'd be maybe 
maybe two or three other people in the truck, and we change seats, and we keep driving back and forth in the same place. Right. And they thought God knows how many troops were in there. Right. So it, I, I, I was I was reading up before you came on the show about how when the unit was formed, there's no manual really for this. There's no guidebook. So you you guys are kind of inventing this on the fly, right? That's right. So this hadn't been done before. That's why they wanted artists and uh, people from the theater and people with imagination. That's why they were that type of person for the, for the outfit. And we only when we went overseas, somebody made the, I got the idea that people over a certain age shouldn't go overseas. So we lost some of our good men that didn't go over. Okay. And they replaced them with regular replacements. They didn't have to be artists or anything. They just had to be soldiers. Right. So, so, so we got a question from uh, Neil. Uh, and I don't know if you know this or not, but um, he wanted to know why um, they couldn't have just gotten patches from the Army, why you guys had to make them. Do you know why that is? Well, a few reasons. First okay. of all, it's not that easy to get anything from the army. You have to fill out ten thousand forms, right? And uh, give reasons. And I mean, by that time, the the uh, whatever they were doing would have been over. Right. So we, didn't the, we didn't have the time. Right. And then they weren't always supplied with uh, with that many patches. Right. But they're probably not sitting around with a with a trunk full of patches, you know, all the time for, for that possible use. Oh, we'd have to have trucks full with all the different units we Yeah. Use. One of the things that I always found interesting is um, that the, uh, the, the 603rd had what they called poop sheets where they'd gone around to all the different divisions uh, and they um, basically uh, looked at um, uh, how they did their bumper markings, how they did their um, uh, shoulder patches, how the MPs were dressed, et cetera, and they had all that information on file so that whenever the uh, 12th Army Group decides that they should do another deception um, uh, and uh, that, that, you know, if it's going to be the 75th Division or if it's going to be the... Um, uh, fourth armored division that you could pull out the sheet and have that information. Right. We also had the lowdown on the, their officers, what they looked like, and we sometimes impersonated them. And uh, another thing, the radio unit would uh, know, would study the German uh, transmission. And they would know how to, uh, what to expect from which German. Right. Because every every uh, person who, who sends out a transmission has their own way of doing it. Yeah. It's like handwriting. Yeah. And, and uh, we would have to also, uh, before we did the, um, the mission, they would watch or uh, listen to the other our own uh, transmitters and find out how they did it so that they'd be able to duplicate it right so they're basically you know somebody said a, a division the fourth armor division might have some protocol where they start every message with four dots or something right 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 uh, and so you know you have to make sure you're doing the same thing and and doing it the same way i don't know Seymour remembers this, or you might know, but we got a question from Mike. I don't know if you saw it. I about, see it here. I'll try to put it up here. Yeah. Um, there, he, uh, uh, Mike uh, Doublestein. Hi, Mike. Wanted to know, um, he said there was a, a an elephant that was painted on the 23rd Special Troop Vehicles that arrived in Normandy. No, I don't Do you remember that. No. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of that either. So, 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 Mike, email me. Tell me what you know, because, because, uh, and and we can try to figure that out or figure out if anybody knows something. But it's not something that uh, that I'm aware of as well. Um, Seymour, I was going to ask you. So, most of the time, you're not out there um, 
trying to set up these inflatables on the front lines. You're back working in the factory section, but on some of the larger missions, you you did participate in the missions, correct? We, we when we had a real large mission, everybody went. So can you tell me about one of those? We went to. You know, it, it it's really not that interesting. I mean, we get in the trucks, we get to where we're going. And unless you're one of the actors in, 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 in the uh, in the mission, you just go about your business the way you would do it if you were a regular soldier, except that you're impersonating somebody. So it really wasn't that uh, exciting. Were you were you interacting with what you call quote unquote regular soldiers? How how did they react to you? I, I didn't. I don't know. I don't know if anybody else did. You know, I never, I never met the people who we were supposed to impersonate. Right. What is your? What would be your most uh, vivid memory um, of your time in Europe? You were there from. Of course, you arrived in England in May, '44. You were there until you came back almost a year later. You know what? What is the thing that stands out to you as? your most memorable experience? I, I had so many of them. I, you know, I don't know what was most memorable. You can pick one, any memorable one. Oh, you got me stumped. Ah. Well, were you in, where were, where were you, uh, were you in Paris for the liberation? Yes. We, that we, has to be memorable. Yeah, it was nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you didn't spend much time there. We were, I think, uh, our part of the unit were there the a few days after they liberated France, so the euphoria was still there. Right. And the crowds in the streets and the uh, women running after the trucks and the children, and we'd be throwing chocolate to the kids and, you know, just all the things you read about. Yeah. But we settled down pretty soon. Paris was good because we did get uh, some time off. Right. We weren't Not a terrible on. place to have time off. Pardon? Not a terrible place to have time off. No, no. We got, I got to go to Versailles and uh, went to uh, the Arc de Triomphe and, you know, the Louvre. As an artist, that was go like going to heaven. Yeah, I bet. So I know. Yeah, uh, I was talking with my co-author Liz Sales the other day, and her dad Bill was in the unit, and uh, she said, uh, "You know, were you were you scared to go to Europe?" And he said, "No, I was excited because I was an artist in Europe and Paris, and even Germany were the centers of the art and design world, and the army was going to send me there." And it's like, good news, you've got your free European vacation. Bad news, they don't really want you there, but you still get to go. Um, so pluses and minuses. So Seymour, were you ever, um, were you ever under shell fire? Or were you ever uh, involved? Scott, uh, one of our listeners. We an air raid. An air raid? An air raid. I uh, forget whether it was when we first came to England. We uh, landed at a place called uh, Avon's Mouth. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was it was a port city for uh, I, don't, I, mem I don't remember the city. It was a big a English city on the west coast, mm -hmm. and uh, they, the Germans sent over a few planes, and uh, they told us to get below decks. So we got below decks. I remember I was there. Uh, you would know Rick um, Helmut Eisenberg. Yep. Yeah, he was right next to me, and he had a droll sense of humor. And uh, the Germans were were uh, dropping bombs, and the anti-aircraft was shooting, and the, the shrapnel was falling all over the deck. And he turns to me, he says, "You know, a guy can get killed around the deck." <laughs> <laughs> I know that that some uh, parts of the unit obviously came in under artillery fire. Um, Scott, during some of the operations, and specifically um, 
in their second to the last operation, Operation Buzanville in March 1945, uh, they had uh, several people killed and um, about 15 seriously wounded uh, by enemy artillery drawn by their deception. So um, Seymour, you were lucky not to be caught in any of that. Yeah. I'll tell you. We heard when we heard about that, the rest of the unit, we were pretty shaken up. Yeah. Because up to that time, we really didn't have much contact with the, with the Germans. Other than having them, uh, you know, coming in contact with them when we went to the coal yards to pick up coal or something and they were shoveling the coal. So, Seymour, you guys were in the Ardennes right before or right as the Battle of the Bulge starts. Do you remember? I, I, was, I was in the Ardennes. We were stationed in Luxembourg. Okay. Luxembourg City. And we had been there for three months, over three months. And it began to be like home. We made ourselves comfortable. We met people. And uh, one day they said, uh, we're getting out of here because the Battle of the Bulge started. And I guess they wanted to get our equipment out of there. So if Luxembourg fell, it wouldn't fall into German hands. Right. And so we packed up most of our equipment, some of the old, uh, older uh, uh, dummies, uh, ones we weren't using, we burnt. And uh, we retreated back to Verdun in France. Okay. And I, I, I should say, Chris, that, that some parts of the unit were conducting a deception in the Ardennes up to the day before right. the Battle of the Bulge. So, yeah. but it wasn't the entire unit. So okay. that's that, that there. We had a question from uh, uh, Thomas Banner who wants to know, um, where were you on VE Day? And do you remember that at all? Yes, I do. How could I forget it? I don't know, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, we were in Germany. Uh, in, uh, I think it was Edar Oberstein in southern Germany. And uh, why we were there, I don't know. I don't think we did any uh, any missions in Germany proper. I think uh, you, were probably, you were probably at that point guarding the displaced persons camps. Well, that was after the, after the, the okay. they had to do something with us because we are no longer useful for, for the mission we were sent over for. So they uh, had us guarding in DP camps, mostly uh, they were mostly Russians, Croatians, and uh, uh, ex-prisoners of war, and so, some families. Yeah. So, Seymour, what were what were your impressions of the Germans? I mean, now that you'd made it to the end and people had, taught, had gotten to the camps and and all of that, what were your I didn't, uh, our, nobody in our unit that I know of came in contact with any of the camps. Well, you'd heard about them, hadn't you? Or I no? heard about them. I, did. I have pictures in my scrapbook. Pictures were circulating. And uh, I never had much use for, for the Nazis and Germans, but going back to 1934 when I was a kid. Right. I had my parents talking about it. Right. And yeah, uh, Seymour, you were, um, I mean, it sort of brings up the, the subject, you're Jewish, and obviously uh, so that was a big uh, uh, part, I'm sure, of why you had no use for the, the Nazis uh, as time went by. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, you have said that uh, the army was one of the first places that you ran into anti-Semitism. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, I came from New York City and uh, we lived mostly in Jewish neighborhoods. I never ran into that. And once in a while, if you came too close to uh, either the Italian section or the Irish section, the kids would run after us. But we kept on it to our own sections of the city and nobody bothered us. It wasn't until I came, got into the army that I realized how vicious people could be. It, it, was, it was a shock. 
I couldn't believe it. I mean, here we're fighting the Nazis and the people in, in my own unit. Yeah, so that had to have been hard uh, uh, for you to deal with. So, so Seymour, we got a question from uh, Melissa. Who may be related to you. Who may be related to you, but she said that um, yes, yes. after the war, you never uh, talked to the family, your family about what you'd done because it was secret. Is there anything that uh, you can add to that or why that was? They told us not to talk about it because uh, they, they thought they were going to have to eventually go to war with Russia. And, and at the time, they weren't foreseeing that war, uh, the way they wage wars will be different years from then. Right. So they thought they may have to use the same uh, deception. So when did you feel like you could talk to your family about this? No, I didn't talk to my family. I didn't tell them anything. But but did a point come? I mean, you're talking about it now. Yeah. So uh, a point obviously came. When did you feel like you could talk about it? In 1995. Okay, 50 years. When the, when the secret came up. They used to ask me, what did you do in the Army? I said I blew up tanks. <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah, and that kept them quiet. Exactly correct. Exactly correct. Um, we have a question that uh, uh, that uh, Tom Allen asks here. He wanted to know if you continued to use your um, uh, design and art talents after the war. Yes, I. When I came home, uh, I uh, wanted to go back to school. But I had a couple of months before the session started, came home during the summer. So I took up my time making a couple of scrap scrapbooks, which are now in the uh, World War II Museum. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to Pratt and finished, got my degree. And uh, I went into packaging, package design. Uh, I wanted to become another Norman Rockwell, but I guess I didn't have the talent. <laughs> you know. Well, I, I want to jump in here and say say a couple of things. One is that um, uh, Seymour has very briefly mentioned his scrapbooks, which I'm going to try to show you just a little bit of, because he had uh, created the most amazing scrapbooks of anybody in this unit, and I'm not dissing any of the other veterans in the unit, but Seymour has been a stamp collector since he was, how old, Seymour? Six. Six. Now, can you guys see this that I've put up? Or am I, can you Not see there? No. Yes or no? I can't see it, Rick. Okay, no. so it may be that I don't know how to do this, or it may be that I have to do one more step and try this, and then oh, go. There go. Yeah, there you go. And then go. This, okay. Right. So uh, uh, Seymour had been a stamp collector since he was about nine, I think. Um, and he's very much a curator. So he created this scrapbook that has just about everything you can imagine in it. It's three or 400 pages of stuff. He must have saved everything, Seymour, in your entire life. Here we have a, a drawing uh, of how he's supposed to uh, have his full field display his shelf display and his footlocker packed, just to make sure that uh, he knows all that. And then you get more information on that. And then uh, we have the, um, uh, you know, we, you have uh, postcards, documents, articles. Uh, if you go further in this, there are maps, there are wine bottle labels, there are, you know, photos, draft registration, etc. And uh, these terrific, two terrific scrapbooks, and um, they were donated originally to the Ghost Army Legacy Project and then to uh, the um, National World War II Museum. And uh, for those of you who are interested, if you go to ghostarmy.org, 
under um, and you look under archive there, you can find about 50 pages or so from each volume of Seymour's scrapbooks, and you can get a little sense of of uh, of, of the, how the war looked to him and how he put that together. I think that's worth making a mention of. Um, and then I, I wanted to ask you, Seymour, about your wife, Vera, who's no longer with us, but she's got an amazing story as well because she was a, grew up uh, as a, uh, a Jewish child in Nazi Germany. Yeah. She, she was uh, 12 years old when a Kristallnacht happened. Kristallnacht, yeah. Yeah. And uh, she... And she used to speak a lot about it. And uh, she says that she remembers being at the window of her house because her, her grandfather was a cantor at a synagogue. This was right across the street. And she remembers being there and seeing the Nazis, the, the mobs, running in, bringing out all the books and everything and lighting them on fire in front of the... Uh, uh, front of the synagogue. And uh, she was 12 years old and she was scared to death. And uh, luckily she had an uncle who was uh, affiliated with one of the larger Jewish organizations in Germany. And he saw to it that Vera, my wife, and her cousins, there were five cousins, six children altogether, were sent out uh, on a kinder transport, which meant that they were put on trains by themselves, no matter how old they were. If they were infants, they allowed them to uh, have a nurse to go with them, but the nurse couldn't follow them any far farther than the border. And uh, so sent out to England. England said they would accept 10,000 children. And she was one of the lucky ones. Her cousins all got out too. The rest of her family perished. Everybody. The kinder transport was, I think, in 1938. 38. Yeah. yeah. She was on the very first kinder transport. Wow. And she said she, she was, remembers the, they were there were Nazi guards on the uh, on the train. Hmm. They were taunting and teasing the children. And these children were all the young, all young kids, and they were crying they, they, just to be torn away from their parents. And uh, these people were having a ball. And she, she had uh, lots of bad memories. How did she get to America, Seymour? Well, she, she uh, they sent him to England, and they put the children up in a... Um, this was December. They put the children up in a now vacant uh, summer camp. They had these little bungalows and they put children in there. And they advertised in the paper, the British papers, that they had children who need a home temporarily. And people were coming there and taking children home with them. And my wife was, uh, at that time, she had just turned 13. She turned 13 on the, uh, uh, the day, two days after she arrived at that camp. So they were, they were eating lunch, and this one woman walked over, and she pointed at her, at my wife. And she said, I'll take that one, in English, of course. My wife didn't understand what she was saying. So she thought they were selling her. And she was going to be sold into slavery. <sighs> so uh, she started to cry, and a lot of the other children do. Did. And the uh, attendant there, the woman that was overseeing the children, explained to them in German that it was all right. They're going to go with somebody and live in their house until their parents can come and get them. And that's how it was explained. It was explained to them, and she was lucky. She got in with a uh, wonderful people, and she lived with them for eight years. Oh wow! 
And, and uh, the, the, the way she came to America was that her father, who had died when she was only two and a half of natural causes, uh, he had a brother that lived in the United States. So the family was in touch. And uh, his, her uncle had three sons. One of them was going into the army and he knew he was going to England. So his father said to him, uh, when you get to England, look up your cousin. Well, he was an 18 year old kid. He said, I don't bother me with that. Right. But when he got there, his conscience got the best of him. And he did look her up and they clicked. So uh, he told his father after, after the war was over in Argentina to bring her over to America, which he did. Well, um, uh, Vera was a great lady and I, it was my pleasure to meet her a couple of times. And um, she had an amazing personality and I swear to God, I think she knew everybody in the entire world. Uh, oh, yeah. She has many, many friends all over the country and all over the world. And if you, an, an anecdote about Vera. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at one time, uh, one one of the rabbis we had at our temple uh, was leaving, and we had a people. That, we had to look for another rabbi. So Vera joined the search committee, and they interviewed quite a few people. And every time. They said, well, we have this rabbi coming from Detroit. And Vera would say, oh, I have a cousin in Detroit. I'll call her and see what they think of the rabbi. And then there's another one from Cleveland. Oh, I have a cousin in Cleveland. And this went on and on. And she had, she had relatives all over the country. Finally, the head of the committee came over. He said, Vera, I've got one that I'm sure you don't know anybody. Here. She said, try me. He says, uh, we have a rabbi from, uh, what the heck was it, St. Catharines in Canada. She says, of course I know somebody there. I have a my father's. So that that's. Yeah, that. and, and, and it's worth mentioning that um, for people interested in Vera Nussenbaum's story that her papers are at the uh, Holocaust Museum in uh, Washington D.C. Correct? Right. Right. So you can you and you can Google her Vera Nussenbaum and find out about her story. And of course, you can Google Seymour and come up with more about uh, uh, his story and um, uh, and the Ghost Army and and his involvement with that. And um, Chris, I thought I'd put up this comment from Patrick Lee, which is a nice uh, way of saying, uh, uh, if I can do it, you know, because I'm not expert here, uh, a nice uh, a comment. He says, Mr. Nussenbaum, thank you, sir, for everything you and every other soldier went through uh, for us. We can all enjoy a peaceful life because of brave men like yourself. So uh, thank you, Seymour. Thank you, Seymour. Any other questions? Anything else? No. Just Is thank you so much. And we we appreciate your coming on, and we'll talk about you after you leave. <laughs> Say nice things. And we will. We promise. You oh. take care, Seymour. Thank you so much. I'm take gonna... care. Okay. Wow. Go. It's a lot of ground there. That was a long war. Lots of, lots of stories, lots to tell. Um, I wanted to mention, too, um, Alyssa Nussbaum uh, sent a, a comment. Can, I don't know. Can people see this as we're talking, or am I just stating the, the screamingly obvious? Right? I, I don't know. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, yeah, Alyssa, people, can you see the comments that other people are yeah. making as we're talking, uh, or are we just being crazy? Um, Alyssa said that there's a photo uh, of Mrs. Nussbaum on the boat uh, during wow. the kinder transport. Um, and if you Google kinder transport, um, you can find her. And then uh, she said she could uh, get us information on that. And then maybe Rick and I can, if not this show, the next show will post um, pictures of that. 
Okay, yeah, we'd be we of course would be delighted to do that. And and as I mentioned, um, so so I um, you won't find Seymour Nussenbaum in the. They can see the comments. They okay, stay the obvious. Stop reading them, probably. Um, but um, uh, and um, oh, here's we see here. But here's one from. We'll put this one up. See, oh, that's Cindy. Cindy, I didn't mean to put it up. Thank you. Too. But I, I wanted to see. We have uh, Yakir Katz, the nice picture there. Uh, but our our boss at Stephen Ambrose says thank you as well. Um, Steve, uh, Seymour's not in the um, documentary film I made about the Ghost Army, which I'm now promoting by mentioning. Sure. Hey, by the way, you see, I wore this for you. Okay, for you. excellent. And I have mine on as well, but I can't seem to figure out where it is <laughs> right there. Um, and uh, which is available on Amazon Prime. And he's not in the book, The Ghost Army of World War II, because I hadn't met him yet. And so um, I didn't meet him until after that. And when I went to his house in Monroe Township, New Jersey, and I, he first showed me his scrapbooks, um, I, I just was like, these must be preserved. And they were literally flaking onto the floor, yeah. right? So when you would turn a page, the, the, the bits of paper, every time you opened that up, there'd be a little pile of paper on the floor. And it was like, well, how quickly can we preserve these before you know they disappear and what we did when Seymour donated them is we we had them uh, conserved and we we scanned and made a, a digital copy of every page and every page of everything that's in there so right. it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages so we preserved that all digitally and then we gave him a copy of that so he still has this scrapbook and it's not gonna flake off and fall right. so and, so, and, and, and since I'm going to spare Rick the same shameless self-promotion. I'm sure you've all seen the documentary, but if you haven't, you really have to. Uh, and if you haven't read the book, go on Amazon, get the book. It's it's great. It's that one. That's yep. Yeah, it's that other unit in World War Two. Um, and, and I and and, and fair is fair, Chris. There are a few other books about the Ghost Army as well. And our mutual friend John Gaughan also wrote a great one called right. Ghosts of T.O. So I, um, I like to never fail to mention that John was in the documentary film. I mean, I do like my book better, but uh, <laughs> I, I, might, I, might be, uh, I might be prejudiced, but John's got a great, um, uh, a, a great take on it as well and uh, a fun topic. Um, and part of a larger topic, I mean, we're not gonna have time to get into it all today, but uh, the whole, what they call now in the military, the information war. You know, uh, we're, gonna, we're talking about trying to do a show just about that, right? Um, about intelligence and, and espionage and deception, and um, yeah, yeah. So, so hopefully we will get to that. Nicole, the documentary is called The Ghost Army because I am, when it comes to titling, I go for obvious. <laughs> uh, it was on PBS, it's on Amazon Prime now, so. And um, Paul Woodage says that John Gunn is an unsung hero. See, so if John is watching, which he's probably not, but if he was watching, see, John, you're not unsung any longer because we're singing your praises uh, uh, as a hero here. So, and Francie uh, uh, had a comment. We are trying to get uh, Congress to award a Congressional Gold Medal to this unit, and we'd made quite a bit of progress lobbying on this. Um, before the current uh, uh, virus situation hit, and obviously that's kind of ground to a halt, but we hope to pick it up perhaps in May, and, and we're trying to make that happen. And, and anybody who is moved by the story of this unit, um, you know, definitely contact your congressperson and, and, and ask them to, to support that. And then we have more on that as well on our website, ghostarmy.org. So, Chris, what do you think? Should we? Done. I uh, well, I would just a uh, couple things really quickly. Um, Please take your time. <laughs> thanks everybody who um, tuned in. I saw a lot of new names this this week, so that's great. It means a lot, and I'm happy to know that people are listening. Um, and uh, Rick and I are always brainstorming uh, for new ideas. So if there are topics that you're interested in or things you'd like us to cover, um, please give a shout out. And if we can put something together. Uh, we certainly will. So well, again, thank you so much. Guys. That, uh, to do that, 
uh, you can email us at hhh at ambrosetours.com. I'm trying desperately to type that so I can make it come on the screen, but that's hhh for uh, History Happy Hour and at ambrosetours.com. And we would be happy to, uh, to entertain suggestions, ideas, etc., cetera, um, possible guests and all that sort of thing. So, so thank you so much, folks. And stay safe, everybody. Okay, cheers. History Happy Hour is checking out. All's well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to find the button still. Okay. <laughs>